Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. My present topic is materialist feminism. I'll distinguish materialist feminism from liberal humanist feminism and also from radical feminism. Liberal feminism finds its origins and its inspiration in the landmark texts of the so-called first wave feminist pioneers like Mary Wollstonecraft and Virginia Woolf. Philosophically, liberal feminism takes for granted a conception of woman as biologically determined and self-evident. But this kind of biological essentialism erases historical difference, the different experiences of women in different socioeconomic classes, and so on. Politically, liberal feminism's agenda has been to gain equal rights for women and access for women to political, social, and economic spheres from which they have traditionally been excluded. Radical feminism, which emerged in the context of the New Left political interventions of the 1960s is considered part of feminism's second wave. In its earliest versions, at least, radical feminism shares with liberal feminism its biological essentialism. But radical feminism views the patriarchal gender hierarchy as the primary structure of oppression upon which other modes of oppression have been based. Whereas liberal feminism seeks to reform the political, economic, and social structures of the Enlightenment society. Radical feminism seeks no less than the abolition of patriarchal power. Liberal feminism's focus on liberation, equality, and personal fulfillment, and radical feminism's focus on the alienation experienced by women under systems of patriarchy, both share some common ground with the humanist Marxism of Marx and Engels' early writing. But it is from the anti-humanist thought of Marx and Engels' later writings that materialist feminism draws its coordinates. Materialist feminist theory differs from both liberal feminist and radical feminist theory in that it views gender as a social construct as well as a biological category. Gendered subjectivities are historically variable, and these definitions can change according to the requirements of production and reproduction under different economic systems. Glimpses of this conception of gender as a social construct can be gleaned from various places in Marx and Engels' work, but the most fully elaborated discussion of gendered subjectivities is found in Engels' The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. This text is not exactly a feminist text because, for Engels, class remains the fundamental category of oppression. But Engels does provide a historical materialist account of the family as a structure organized in the service of the economic production of a society rather than as a natural form of human association based on personal affections. In Engel's account, the social constitution of gendered relations within the structure of the family is inseparable from the systems of power that produce and maintain class exploitation, Engels writes. According to the materialist conception, the determining factor in history is, in the final instance, the production and reproduction of immediate life. This, again, is of a twofold character. On the one side, the production of the means of existence, of food, clothing, and shelter, and the tools necessary for that production. On the other side, the production of human beings themselves, the propagation of the species. Engels, of course, is not endorsing or promoting this definition of the role of women within patriarchy that consigns women to the role of reproduction. Quite the contrary. Ingalls is describing the historical role of women in patriarchy in order to clear the way for a revolution in the relations between women and men through a redefinition of the family. To this end, Ingalls produces a non-traditional definition of monogamy. For Ingalls, the so-called monogamous 
nuclear family is not really monogamous at all because, he argues, it's only monogamous for the woman. The man is free to have extramarital relationships. Marital fidelity for the woman is rigidly imposed, Ingalls argues, in order to guarantee the rights of property through the assurance of proper inheritance. In a truly monogamous marriage relationship, one which was designed not to protect property rights, but to serve the interests of the parties involved, any woman or man could divorce his or her partner and enter a new marriage relationship, or not, as she or he chose to do. Only in this kind of a relationship, free from the constraints of economic and property considerations, could there be genuine monogamy and free association between the sexes. Affinities with Marx's thought can be found in two of the landmark texts of 20th century feminism, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own and Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own is certainly no Marxist treatise. Its argumentative logic is firmly based in the liberal humanist tradition. And yet Woolf turns again and again to powerful examples based in economic considerations. The economic constraints that prevent women from having the same opportunities and from achieving the same accomplishments as do men. In a typical passage, Wolf castigates, mocks seriously, the ancestors of an imaginary Oxbridge student she calls Mary Seaton for having not endowed the women's college as the forefathers of their sons have endowed the men's colleges. She writes of the female ancestor. Now, if she had gone into business, had become a manufacturer of artificial silk or a magnet on the stock exchange, if she had left two or three hundred thousand pounds to Fernham, we could have been sitting at our ease tonight, and the subject of our talk might have been archaeology, botany, anthropology, physics, the nature of the atom, mathematics, astronomy, relativity, geography. If only Mrs. Seaton and her mother and her mother before her had learnt the great art of making money and had left their money, like their fathers and their grandfathers before them, to found fellowships and lectureships and prizes and scholarships appropriated to the use of their own sex, we might have dined very tolerably up here alone, off a bird and a bottle of wine. We might have looked forward without undue confidence to a pleasant and honorable lifetime spent in the shelter of one of the liberally endowed professions. We might have been exploring or riding, mooning about the venerable places of the earth. Only if Mrs. Seaton and her like had gone into business at the age of fifteen, there would have been. That was the snag in the argument no Mary. Now consider this passage from the first chapter of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. After a long account of the conditions and functions of reproduction in mammals, de Beauvoir concludes, it is impossible to measure in the abstract the burden imposed on woman by her reproductive function. The bearing of maternity upon the individual life regulated naturally in animals by the estrous cycle in the seasons, is not definitely prescribed in woman. Society alone is the arbiter. The bondage of woman to the species is more or less rigorous according to the number of births demanded by society and the degree of hygienic care provided for pregnancy and childbirth. Thus, while it is true that in the higher animals the individual existence is asserted more imperiously by the male than by the female, in the human species, individual possibilities depend upon the economic and social situation. In the second sex, de Beauvoir develops an analysis of women's subordinated role in the gender hierarchy as materially, socially, and historically determined. It's a condition not to be essentialized, neither to be humanized, but to be recognized and transformed. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But if you have questions or comments about this topic, send me an email.